Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for uh, joining us here today for our third press conference of the World Economic Forum annual meeting here in Davos Clusters. Also, welcome to our, our audience uh, watching on our webcast platform. Very delighted to, to, to learn uh, at rather short notice um, yesterday that we were to uh, have a press conference on the uh, grave and, and severe crisis uh, of Ebola. I'm very delighted that my two panelists have uh, to find time in their diary today on this very busy day to, to join us. I'm going to introduce them in a second. I Just to, to give a bit of context, there are over 20 sessions uh, on Ebola, on the private and public uh, program here in Davos this week. David Nabarro um, has already spoken on two this morning. It's, uh, it's certainly an issue which is maybe no longer as high on the news headlines, but it's seriously a very serious issue at the forum. I know we're looking at the, uh, the issue and the problem in a variety of ways, how to better use technology, whether there are any governance gaps, how can, how can the international community and multi-stakeholder communities come together to work more effectively to, to address this current challenge and, and to address future challenges of a similar ilk in the future. Now, without further ado, I will um, introduce my, uh, my, my, my two colleagues, Baroness Amos, Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, Emergency Relief Coordinator of the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, otherwise known as OCHA, and David Nabarro, the Special Representative of the UN Secretary General for Food Security, Nutrition, and the Special Envoy on Ebola, again from the United Nations. Now, I'm going to ask Baroness Amos to start by giving us an update on the uh, operations on the ground with regards to um, how uh, yeah, the efforts to address Ebola are going. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Ebola, of course, as we know, is an extremely uh, serious uh, disease with global significance. It's a major coordination uh, challenge uh, with a significant impact, particularly on three countries, Sierra Leone, Liberia and Guinea. The world has come together in an extraordinary way to support uh, those three countries. And we're very pleased that there are early signs of a reduction uh, in uh, Ebola in all three countries. And of course, Mali has just been declared Ebola free. It's important that we continue our work in three main areas. First, in the area of stop and treat, where we are focused on Ebola elimination. Secondly, on the maintenance of essential services in each of the countries. And of course, uh, this has put a huge strain uh, on the maintenance of uh, essential services in all three countries. And of course, the work we're doing on the longer term. We've already seen the economic uh, consequences of the Ebola outbreak, not just in terms of the three countries in uh, West Africa, but many other countries on the African continent as well. We have to remain vigilant. And as the Secretary General of the United Nations said yesterday, complacency would be our worst enemy. I'm going to hand over to Dr. Nabarro, who is going to uh, update us on the overview of our requirements. And then we'll be very happy to take any of your questions or comments. Thank you. And thank you very much indeed, uh, Valerie Amos, for the introduction, but also for the way in which you have brought the whole of the humanitarian apparatus of the UN system in behind the global response to Ebola. I'm going to offer a number of facts and figures. Then I'm going to talk about the revised overview of requirements. And then I'm going to hopefully be in a position to take any questions you might have. And just if anybody's watching this webcast, please do feel free to be in touch with us. My email is nabarro at un.org. And I'd be very happy to try to deal with questions. I can't promise to deal with all, but I'll do my best. I started as the envoy on Ebola uh, in August this year. And at the time that I took up my appointment, we were observing an outbreak where the numbers of new cases was increasing exponentially. That means that it's accelerating faster and faster 
week by week. In fact, it was doubling about every three weeks. It was a very scary situation indeed. Some of you may know that there were projections of perhaps as many as 1.4 million people affected by Ebola by the end of the year. There was also real anxiety about the number of weekly caseloads that there might be, numbers of people actually needing treatment. And I'm not surprised because at that time, when I visited treatment centres, they were full and people were turning up and they were getting sick and sometimes actually dying at the door because there was nowhere to treat them. It was a terrible situation, particularly in Monrovia in Liberia, but also in Sierra Leone and in Guinea. Well, this terrifying scenario has not materialized. The devastating spread of the disease has slowed and the epidemic has started to turn. We're beginning to see an overall decline in the number of new cases each week. So Liberia has reported the sharpest decline. In September, there were 300 new cases of Ebola identified each week in Liberia. Now it's less than 10 cases per week today. In Guinea, the number has declined from 114 last week to less than 30 in the following week. And then in Sierra Leone, we've seen a reduction last week of December, 330 cases and 140 per week on average during January. Taken with the news that Valerie Amos just described from Mali, we have a very attractive and promising situation that leads us to believe that perhaps we're beginning to see the end of the outbreak. Unfortunately, it's not quite as simple. And the reason for that is that if there is any case of Ebola in the region, that can restart an outbreak very quickly. Because this disease is devastating when it gets transmitted from person to person in body fluids. So we've been really focusing on a number of key activities. The first is to encourage communities to change the way they behave so they're less likely to spread the disease. And that's been happening. It's been happening in a widespread way and it's probably the main reason why the declines have happened. But the next step, having constructed treatment centers, having made burials safer, is to turn ourselves into a community of detectives who travel far and wide in the affected countries, an area that's greater than that of the British Isles and only slightly smaller than France, and to go to every single nook and cranny and to try to find people who've got Ebola or who are suspected of having it and making sure they come under treatment quickly. It's really tough stuff. It requires epidemiologists, social mobilizers, public health specialists, contact tracers, hundreds and hundreds of them. And they're being put into the region by the UN system and by our partners by the African Union and by ECOWAS, all the time under the overall supervision of the national governments, with the World Food Program, with UNICEF and others providing all the support needed. To sustain this effort, the United Nations system needs resources. In order to help us do this, we've revised our overview of requirements and this document, which is released today, which is the overview of needs and requirements for the UN system for 2015, is now being made available to the world. We're asking for a further $1 billion worth of assistance during 2015 to be spread between the World Health Organization, UNICEF, the World Food Programme, the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, UN Development Programme, the International Organization of Migration, United Nations Population Fund, the Food and Agriculture Organization, the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, 
the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Action and UN Women. The amounts required vary hugely, with most being needed by the WHO, by UNICEF and by the World Food Programme, particularly for their logistics operation. Some of these monies will go directly to the agencies, some will go into the Secretary General's Trust Fund. All will be spent to support the activities of government and civil society in the affected countries and to permit, prep permit preparations in those that surround. I'm ready if there's any questions about it. Otherwise, what I'd like to do is to suggest that you take the document, have a good look at it, and if you would like any further information, please let me know. Thank you very much indeed. And can I end by uh, thanking uh, everyone who has been involved in this response. And I think particularly we have to thank the communities themselves. We have to thank the NGOs on the ground, the national and the international NGOs uh, that have been operating, uh, the governments themselves, the multilateral organizations, uh, the African uh, Union, uh, the countries uh, far and wide that have been uh, extraordinary uh, donors to our response efforts. Thank you. Thanks both. Now we do have time for questions. Is, is there anybody in the room who cares to put their hand up? So, could you just remind us your name please and your organization? Yes, uh, Frédéric Durand with NHK Japanese Public TV. Um, if I'm not mistaken, you've already asked for $1.5 billion. So is it uh, okay to understand that altogether we have $2.5 million required for, for um, uh, Ebola response? And what is the current status of uh, funding, please? Thank you. So in, sep in September, we asked for nearly $1 billion. We readjusted the estimate in October to 1.5. And so the appeal was for around $1.5 billion. By the end of 2014, we had raised just around $1 billion of that $1.5 billion. Subsequently, we further increased our needs. The total needs is $1 billion and no more. And we now need, sorry, the total needs for resources is $1 billion now, and that's what we need to raise. So therefore, what we've done is to expand the envelope of need, but we've also taken account of the resources that have been received. And the document that I've given you, the one with the red cover, includes some assessment of progress that's been made to date, as well as a statement of need. And a more detailed assessment of progress is in the blue covered document, which is also available for you. Okay. Gentlemen in the front row, please, again, if there's a microphone coming, could you, for benefit of our audience online, could you remind us of your name and your outlet? Uh, Ken Choi from uh, Chosen Daily Newspaper, Korea. What kind of uh, coordinated, coordinated efforts are being done uh, on developing this vaccine or the, for the cure? Thank you. At the moment, we have two candidate vaccines that are being tested, and they are being given to humans as part of the trialing. There is some promise. It looks as though they may turn out to be uh, working vaccines, uh, but they won't come available, even under the best of assumptions, until at least the middle of this year. In terms of treatments, there are clinical trials underway of a number of experimental therapies. One of the ones that seems to be most promising is an antiviral that is being tested in a number of locations and it looks as though we may start to see some results in about two months' time. So in the background to this effort to do public health control of the virus, we have got vaccines potentially coming on stream and new treatments looking as though they may have promise. Thank you. Any more questions? Jill. Please. And uh, again, for our audience, remind us your name and your organisation. Jill Trino from The Guardian. I apologise, I was a little late arriving. I just wonder how, how much longer do you think people will keep suffering? How, how far are you into solving this crisis? I described the response in two phases, Jill. The first was uh, the effort earlier this year to try to reduce the phenomenal suffering high levels of sickness and death 
occurring because of an exponential increase in the spread of the disease. That has proved to be successful in that incidence levels are now declining sharply in Liberia and they're coming down also in Sierra Leone and Guinea. The next step of painstaking detective work to try to find every individual with suspected Ebola, to track and trace their contacts, to make sure they come under treatment, and to try to understand why the infection is persisting, is where we're into now. This is a tougher job. We can't put a time limit on it. But what we can do is, saying, is say to you uh, that there will be a massive effort involving African Union, ECOWAS in West Africa, the World Health Organization and other parts of the UN system and partners to get communities mobilized and then to undertake this epidemiology and public health work in order to go to every last case. And as you can tell, I've not put, I waffled on and didn't put a time on it, but that's deliberate because I really don't think we can say when it's going to end. And can I add that, uh, of course, resources are focused on that, but we're also very aware that we have to work uh, with the countries to maintain essential services. We have to uh, be planning now for the longer term because these are post-conflict uh, countries that will require significant support going forward. And we're also conscious of the fact that we need to take the lessons learnt from this in terms of how we deal with any future pandemics. And there is a, uh, a session on this uh, here at Davos tomorrow. Thank you very much indeed. Well, mindful of time, I think we're going to call this press conference to a close. I'd just like to thank my panel for joining us and also yourselves and also our audience online. As I mentioned, there are a number of sessions on Ebola in the programme during the coming four days and I encourage you all to join as many as you can if you're interested in this subject. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.